Hello and welcome to part two of Punishing Brutality's Christmas Brutality 2020. If you would like to hear our retrospective of the year and our preamble, plus numbers 10 through 6 of our respective top 10s, then you can find part one on our YouTube, on our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever. I don't know. Just go and have a look. You'll find it. But this is part two. This is our top fives for 2020. Thanks for listening. So next up, at in at number five, we have... Um, you ever heard of Napalm Death? I have. Some band called Napalm Death. Uh, so they released their 42nd album this year, um, Throws of Joy in the Eyes of Defeatism. I'll put this at number five. I mean, with this, it's kind of, you know, there's apparently no end to Shane Embry's creativity. He's in like about five or six different bands at any given time. Uh, it kind of amazes me that this album, because of that, this album ended up being as good as it is. Um, but it gained, you know, top marks across the board. There's been a lot of kind of, you know, a lot of very, very positive reviews. To me, it sounds like a like a culmination of smear camp, the smear campaign, which came out about 15 years ago, um, and it kind of got me back into them, having not really listened since Fear and Despair. And that they sort of, there's a lot of different, you know, you've got the the original, obviously, literally different lineups and what have you, but kind of, you know, there's a lot of people who like the earlier stuff, uh, the pure grind stuff. But I really think that, like, as of smear campaign or possibly the album before that i can't remember what the name was but onwards it's almost like that's a different different band and a different career and it feels to me that this is sort of the the culmination of of those albums um it's been sold as their post-punk album which yeah i mean there are definitely those influences on there um a moral is so similar to killing joke i actually when it came up randomly on my uh music list i, I actually thought it was a killing joke song but to be honest with you, although there's experimentation in, in tracks such as Joy de la Viva and some of the operatic vocals and stuff like Contagion, this is Napalm Death through and through. Um, Backlash, just because, reminds me of Fear, Emptiness, Despair era Napalm Death, which they absolutely hate, apparently. But it's the album that, that I got into first. Um, and that track in particular, it just does a total about turn at the end and just descends into total carnage. Uh it might sound like a bit of a, a, a bit of a stretch, but apparently uh, Shane Embry is a big fan of Canute, we mentioned earlier, and this track reminds me of them a bit, although in a totally Napalm Death kind of way. Uh, what did you think of it? I'm gonna Not I'm nice. gonna be uh, unacceptable in the metal scene, and just th- no. there's 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 just something about Napalm Death that just doesn't hit with me. I just don't doesn't understand it. what it is. I, I think it's partly the vocals. Um, the, I don't know. There's just some some kind of tenor of the vocals or something that just kind of like scratches me a little bit. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, no, I mean, I, I, I listened to it full of fucking amazingly intense riffing. And, you know, like like you say, it's absolutely all over the place. It's, it's obviously high quality grind. Um, and it's pushing the boundaries of grind. I can I can see that. But it just there's just something about it that just... Do it doesn't for you. doesn't work for me, and I, I I don't quite know what it is, but there it is. Fair enough, man. Well, I think it's a it's a pretty good, very good addition to their catalogue, um, and yeah, hence why it's ended up my top ten list. Let's listen to a bit of backlash just because. Quite nice, Andy.
from our hometown. Well, my hometown, or maybe not even my hometown, but yours too, after a fashion, I guess. Um, Leeds. You were born in Leeds. You were born in Leeds. I thought you were a Worcester lad. No, not so. No, I grew up in Worcester. I was born in Leeds. Lived in Leeds till I was nine, mate. Oh right. Oh, so we we, ca- we kind of went think- in opposite directions because I was born in London. They still think I'm a Leeds. Yeah. Yeah. No, born in Leeds, mate. I'll, sh- I'll send you a picture of my passport yep. later. Yorkshire born, it. Yorkshire bred. Yeah. Bag yeah, them. Miserable as well, <laughs> as well. So just like a true Yorkshire. Fuck yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, so from Leeds, it's um, it's cryptic shift, and the album is Visitations from Enceladus. Hey, from Leeds. Fucking are from Leeds, mate. Did you not know no that? No way, I had no idea. Yeah. Well, now you do. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. So, in a year with uh, no blood incantation, the sci fi metal has not been lacking. Uh, we talked about Afterbirth earlier, but um, there were also really fucking stellar offerings from Warp Chamber, Cosmic Putrefaction, um, and others mm. um, really shone, but like this one fucking hell like this is really really good um i mean really from this point on i would say that any of the these top five are kind of as far as i'm concerned deserving of number one uh but yeah there has to be some kind of order to this thing so you know don't read too much into it but fucking hell right the first fucking track is 26 fucking minutes long oh cool (laughs) And, and and how fucking majestic it is like to carry a track like that all that time without ever getting remotely dull it does help i think if you have a band of fucking supreme musicians especially yeah. uh john riley on the fretless bass who just dominates um and my god like this is this is technical stuff from everyone involved yeah. and it is wanky but like not in a pretentious way it's just sitting perfectly within this concept and the aesthetic and and the production is perfect and I I mean it, it's oh, it's just it's so good it, it is like a fucking metal nerd's dream this album it just for me just brilliant it's uh, I'm so proud this has come from Leeds um it's it's amazing it's always been a good strong music scene there but like as far as I'm concerned this smokes everything from the UK this year um of all shapes and sizes is just definitely one of the best albums of the year number five on my list but you know like i said could could easily be number one um i didn't think you would like this but but you had some positive things to say about it the other day what what, what do you make of this uh i've got written here the basis reminds me of the guy from mudvane <laughs> oh my god <laughs> okay i take it back Okay, no, no, no. Then seriousness. I mean, like, yeah, I put the, you know, it was really avant-garde. The intro is quite noodly. I was surprised there was no sax. Um, <laughs> it definitely, it definitely wasn't what I saw coming. It's sort of freeform jazz drone sludge death. Um, I found it interesting. There were a lot of changes. It literally kept, it just kept me guessing all the way. I was happy to play it straight to some extent uh, from time to time, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what it, to me, I thought they probably own a couple of death albums. The playing was just, I mean, yeah. leagues ahead of just about everybody I can think of. The band were tight. It's probably one of the more technical bands I've heard in a while. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of sheer technical ability, it was probably, you know, probably the, the highest ranking on your list and probably mine as well, for that matter. It was, yeah, really, really good. So from a technical standpoint, I thought it was awesome. Yeah, so. I mean, just amazing musicianship. You can't deny that. I'd say, you know, yes, Death, absolutely a, a, a an influence. It's, it's not really that kind of... I didn't really think of it as being a death metal album, like in really kind of the conventional sense. Certainly not the kind of, you know, like Dirty Death, HM2s kind of stuff that we hear so much of these days. You mentioned uh, the, al- the, the band Death. I certainly think Atheist as well have a... a big influence here and you know with with the bass playing and and just the kind of whole yeah, just kind of abstract nature of it but yeah absolutely fucking brilliant um and everybody knows that i love a really good guitar solo so here's two of them a pair of face melters from uh petrified in the hypogean jail
Oh yeah. Alright. What is it armor, Jill? Is it armor? <laughs> Alright, so we are down to number four now, aren't we? Uh yeah. So this is this is, I gotta admit, it is a complete curveball in terms of brutality. In fact it's not really puni- uh, no, it's not really punishing or brutal, but definitely abrasive in its own kind of way. Uh, it's the latest album from Mets, uh, which is called Atlas Vending. Um, I guess it's more post-hardcore, shouty, scratchy, indie punk, slightly reminiscent of uh, Daughter's self-titled album. Um, it differs from a lot of the other stuff that I've heard within this, this vein. That you spend a lot of time doing that sort of sarcastic and noisy type thing that puts you on edge and does tend to annoy me a bit. But they also have, you know, they do that on tracks such as Pulse and Blind Youth Industrial Park, uh, whose opening riff must be one of the, the year's riffs for sure. But they do diversify in some stripped out sec- tripped out sections, which some might call selling out, but I think it's a good way of contrasting their already existing approach. Uh, the Mirror has some really dire melodies in there and a kind of a droning vocal style effect. The ceiling is basically summary by comparison to a lot of the stuff there, but still, still manages to sound like the oral equivalent of... Uh, Completely unexpected rainstorm on a clear day. Um, that was very Alan Partridge, I apologise. Anyway, oh probably the biggest contrast in the whole album is the end section to Hail Taxi, which actually sounds genuinely psychedelic and upbeat, and it was the one that made me think there was more worth investigating to them. I'd heard them before, and I thought it's that kind of Steve Albini-esque uh, indie punk type stuff, and I was like, okay, that's fine, but it's not really my thing, but... Yeah, it, it really drew me in, and the more that I kept going back to listen to it, the more I got into it. I think if you're a fan of like In Utero by Nirvana, or maybe some of the less metal-inclined Ken Mode stuff, maybe a bit of At The Drive-In, this would probably be you know, an album that people into that sort of stuff would like. I don't believe you were so positive about it, were you, Matthew? Well, look, what, what I would say is that the strength of punishing brutality is our diversity. And that means mm. that we're not always going to agree on everything, but our listeners, dear listeners, do mm. get a, a, a diverse uh, selection. Um, and that comes with the fact that we don't always agree on absolutely everything, as we've already heard. Um, this is this this is kind of in a particular vein of stuff which I just don't particularly get on with. Um, yeah. And... Which is kind of weird because, and I, I don't know how many times we've said this on um, uh, on PB, but like, kind of like, can, I, I hear a, a Fugazi influence, and I fucking love Fugazi. Yes. Um, well, I was going to say actually, I, I would have thought that would have sold you, but yeah, yeah obviously not. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's just something about it that I, I, I couldn't quite get on with. But um, yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's a very Wilson pick, and and you know, if I had heard this. I would have immediately forwarded it on to you because I would have known that you would love it. Um, it's uh, it's my inner art punk indie kid in, coming exactly. out. Exactly, you're so sophisticated. I am, I am, yeah. Um, cool, man. Uh, well, uh, let's listen to an excerpt from the track Hail Taxi.
Okay, so my number four is um, The Eternity of Sheog by Esoctrillium. Esoctrillium. Um, on iVoid Hanger Records. Um, so it's the fifth full length from the French multi instrumentalist Astagul. Um, performing what I think is a rare feat. Is that, is that his real it, name? It is, it is, yes. Oh, wow. um, and um, he really has that corpse paint on his face too. Um, yeah. He, he uh, performs the rare feat of balancing music. Um, this is my opinion, not everybody's. Balancing music that is genuinely avant-garde and genre-bending and boundary-defying, while at the same time being accessible and, dare I say it, enjoyable and fun. It's like, Mm -hmm. it's packed with great fucking songs and some savage riffs and overflowing with this bizarre atmosphere of mysticism that aligns perfectly with the Esoctrillium aesthetic. I think Alan Brown's uh, Dracula of Mars is one of the album covers of the year. It's a fucking weird one. Like when I first looked at it, I thought, what the hell? But yeah, like it just fits so perfectly with the fucking album. Um, the term uh, multi-instrumentalist gets thrown around a lot, but Astagul is absolutely all over the place on this one. I, I mean, half the time I have no idea what it is he's even playing. There's often like violins and other kind of bowed strings, stringed instruments, but like check out the fucking doom laden horns on conquering march namhera um however i think the introduction of a like mellow kind of harp or i don't know some kind of loop over the sick chugging groove in the second track ex any sof is the instant that i kind of got this album and uh it's mm-hmm. arguably my metal moment of the year it's fucking weird but wonderful this is another one that I'm cool. kind of like, hmm. What what did you make of this, Wilson? Scream o death. Scream o death. That's interesting. <laughs> Had elements of new Manurian, I thought, but also like some straight death metal. It reminded me of Skeleton Witch. Uh, didn't really like this one as much to be honest. You mate it reminded me of Death Heaven in places. So. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think that you would like this one. This is definitely yeah. not not in your sphere. This is, but I don't normally really go for stuff that this avant garde either. Um, yeah, but, I think this was like the least of the ones that I, I like that you sent me to be honest. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me in the slightest. But anyway, I fucking love this. Um, you, dear listener, can uh, make your uh, own judgment. Um, <laughs> This is. I'm right. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> you you may well be. You may well be, and I I, I might just be uh, pretentiousness uh, sniffing my own farts. But this is X any so first yeah. passage exiled from sanity, by yeah. um, X Trillium on the album The Eternity of Sheol.
we are now down to number three. And my selection is uh, Splinters from an Ever-Changing Face by End. Um, these are a bit of a super group of sorts. Uh, well, I mean, I say that. So it's Will Putney, who is like a really kind of renowned producer now, but he started off doing bands like um, Suicide Silence and people that, you know, weren't quite so great. Now he's ended up doing stuff like Pig Destroyer. Yeah, uh, he used to do Thy Art is Murder, Suicide Silence, and The Amity Affliction. Um, the singer is also from another kind of band of, of that ilk, which makes this all the more surprising. Um, basically, with this band, it kind of seems like the influence of Nails is starting to come out of the woodwork now, like 10 years down the line from their first album, on Silent Death. And this album, they, they released an EP a couple of years ago that was really, really good. Um but then they they released the uh, lead sing single for it uh, called Pariah, which I have absolutely rinsed the fuck out of this year. I absolutely love that song. Whenever it comes on, I play it two or three times in a row. Uh, for me, it's probably the best metal song of the year. Um, it's kind of funny when you think that they're bands from, you know, they're playing bands such as Fit for an Autopsy. But that being said, Billy Reimer of Dillinger Escape Plan joined for this album, which to me kind of, bolstered it quite a lot and it sort of shows the music's not as skittish as Dillinger but there's a lot of quite cool tricks and curveballs that he throws in I mean he's my favourite contemporary drummer so he's worth listening to for him alone musically it's just relentless, noisy, abrasive and harsh, hardcore, metalcore uh, like a bit more of a palatable version of Cult Leader and intentional or not, Nails is fairly present although you could argue that Nails weren't necessarily reinventing the wheel themselves um, they're more unconventional than a lot of bands in this ilk, I'd say. There's kind of like harsh blasts of noise and beatdowns to get the point across. It can seem a bit impenetrable at first listen and it's pretty chaotic, but there are some really, really fucking blinding riffs in here. Um, there's not a huge amount of variety in here. There's some kind of bit of diversion here, but it's, it's a lot of different approaches to hardcore with occasional time shifts, dissonant chord patterns and creeping guitar lines to offset the heavy riffs. Uh, it's well played and well executed. If you like Nails, Cult Leader, Gaza, but are looking for something a bit more conventional, um, but bringing something slightly new to this sort of area of music, then this is your band. What did you think of it? Yeah. Um, well, we talked about this one a little bit um, when it came out, and yeah, I mean, excellent. It's, 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 it's on my list somewhere, fuck knows where. Um, but yeah, very... very um, like everything you say just just an extremely high standard of metal hardcore and mm. um i completely agree i i do have pariah down there as my breakdown of the year that shit it's fucking that amazing. shit fucking pummels like you would which bit? One bit or the beginning bit or which the... bit it just all <laughs> the, the well the bre the breakdown the, the the bit where you you can just visualize everybody doing the kind of windmill kicking in the uh in the pit and just like doing Your press ups and everything it's, it's, it's yeah. tough it's the one af it is fucking <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's such a fucking crime that they couldn't play. I mean, this live would be absolutely destructive. Yeah. And there's there's no doubt I think that they would, you know, they'd be probably in a similar level of reverence as people like Nails by that, this point, I think, if, if the, you know, if the COVID hadn't fucked everything. But it's just a really, really exceptional album, and I still listen to it now. And, and it maybe was like a little, not weird, but a kind of, I struggled to find the hooks a little bit at first, but as it's gone on and I've listened to it more, I'm like, yeah, this is a, a, a brilliant album. So yeah. Shall we listen to Pariah? Yes. Let's listen to Pariah three times. Yes. Three times. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
So, um, yeah, getting into my number three uh, now. It's really becoming obvious to me. I didn't really think about it this much, but just like how fucking different our lists are. It's it's quite strange. Mm. Um, no, I mean, like, I, I, I love your list. It's fucking great. Um, but it just mine is way fucking with way pussier than yours <laughs> maybe the way that, so i'm not tough at all man anyway um you just get you need to get on those games man. get the weights dude buy some weights buy a weight I, set uh, like a big frame of proper like industrial st- like level like weights and get yourself get those games dude, on man that's I've what you not, need i've not been in the gym um since like fucking february so like i guess that's where all my testosterone and machismo is like just fucking evaporated or something anyway i bought some weights man i had to yeah i, yeah. I, I, feel, I feel you <laughs> um so yeah um number three uh is phanerozoic 2 uh mesozoic cenozoic uh by the ocean collective um it's the second part of their phanerozoic double concept album um mm-hmm. as with uh phanerozoic one each song uh, charts a geologic period um, and this one takes us from the Triassic uh, through to the Holocene that's that's now the, the previous one uh, ended with the great dying of the Permian era I find this stuff fascinating it makes me go and read shit about this anyway um, the band uh, continues their own um, never-ending evolution and, and despite I think being like conceptually tied to fan one they have not like stood still at all uh, fan two, I think, is is, is progier, I, I, slightly less heavy, but I, I don't know if that's just my perception or, or just maybe I don't know. Um, and definitely tests out some new stylings, including even a foray into black metal blasts in the Pleistocene. Mm. Um, it's characterized though by, and, and I think like really kind of dominating the album are just some like hugely memorable choruses in some absolutely epic songs. Um, the second track, uh, Jurassic Cretaceous, is really two songs uh, joined together with two, um, you know, two different choruses, both of which are fucking like really, really memorable. Um, there's also a mellow instrumental, which was a very interesting choice to release as a single. Um, so this album did take a little getting used to for me. Um, but once it clicked, I mean, fuck, I, like, I love it. I mean, this has been the one that's had me, like, singing along at the top of my lungs all fucking year. Um, yeah, I mean, an incredible album, just a brilliant band. I, 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 I just love The Ocean, and um, their, their previous offering was, you know, I think, I, I think I had it at maybe four or something like that in, in, in 2018. And I, I think I did it in injustice. It, it's done nothing but grow on me. But this one, um, hmm, is it better? I don't, I don't know. It's 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 every bit as good. Um, I think at the risk of being petty, um, the main reason this is not number one is because of the utterly infuriating and completely perplexing decision to not include the album Closer Holocene on the vinyl edition. I, I listen to vinyl that's that's my primary medium I, I i buy records and i listen to vinyl and like to not include the final song on a on an album very, is, cool, especially yeah. when it's like a fucking concept album that like yeah. it, it's and holocene is so meaningful because that's the, the that's the the geologic period where human influence starts to take you know it starts to impact the climate and everything like that like that's the fucking point of the album, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like why? I uh, and and there's and there's so many there's so many beautiful bits in Holocene as well. I don't know it as well as the rest of the album because I don't fucking own it. But like, you know, yeah. there's like really cool bits in there where it kind of like starts bringing back refrains from earlier in the album, and like, yeah. and it's just it's such a like it ties the knot on not just this album but the one before as well. And they didn't fucking put it on the record. It just drives me insane. Yeah, it's like how can like like I would have thought like the point of vinyl is there'd be a bit more of a selling point and something different about it. In this case, there is something different about it. But how how is that an advantage to remove some of the music? I don't really understand uh, that thought process. Ma- it's maddening. <laughs> I just can't. I'm, I understand that with vinyl you are actually constrained, like by 
how much you can fit on a record and you might want to kind of like you if you want to create like a hour and 10 minute long album i'm not sure exactly how long this is then that means you're talking about a double album i get that right so if you do that then, then do make it, it a up. fucking double album <laughs> yeah, like, right. like yeah. you know it's very weird yeah. or make or make like like the um rollo tomasi album right that 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 uh, i've got that on um vinyl and that's a three-sided with one-sided etched um yeah oh, really? same with the um the uh dead to a dying world album that i referred to at the beginning of the, the call uh like come on guys fucking hell you can't just not give us yeah, the I final mean, you know, song of the album if they're gonna go if they're gonna go to all that you know all all the extent of like what i assume is probably like a fairly elaborate artwork package is, and all yeah. rest of it that, that, that people do buy art for uh the buy, buy vinyl for you know people are into that sort of thing at least put all the music on there, man. You know that is the that is the, that is ultimately the point of it. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's it, it is it is a fucking brilliant album. It, it like it, it could very easily be number one, um, but they just kind of pissed me off a little bit. I mean, what did you make of it? Well, I mean, there's that one song that sounds like Maroon Five. It's, it does sound like Maroon Five. <laughs> <laughs> the beginning, the beginning it's of Clears the Scene like, sounds like Maroon Five. I'm sorry, it does. I was like, how you how you find the Maroon Five album, Matt? And you're like, <laughs> uh, not sorry, how, how are you finding the Ocean album, Matt? And you're like, it's really really good, but there's one song that towards the end that sounds like Maroon Five, <laughs> and I listened to it and I was like, it really does. And you were like, once you've heard it, you can't unhear it, and you were completely right. It sounds like Maroon. Ding, ding. Dang, 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 whatever it is it's just got that kind of scronky sort of it just sounds like maroon yeah. 5 it really does like so, sorry five. pb listeners <laughs> now you can't unhear it either but it's true it's no, fucking true it's, it's interesting with the ocean because i first saw them in fucking hell, i think it was 2009 at damnation in leeds in a really really small room when it was the first i'd heard of them and i think it's when they still had the, it was when they still had the people out of coil guns in the band and it was much more abrasive and hardcore orientated, and it still had the progressive element to it, but it was much more rare. Uh, now like, I listen to it, and it's very like it's quite like, like I know you struggled with Tool, but honestly, I listen to I listen to the later Ocean stuff, and I'm like, there is a lot of Tool in their sound, like a huge amount of Tool in their sound. Um, I thought it was cool, and it's it was good to see that it kind of matched up to the album before as well, because I think that's always a risk with people who like try to stretch one one set of material over two albums that it might get a bit i mean you know stretching yourself quite thin isn't it to, to have like a sequel to an album that's, that matches up but yeah. yeah it sounds by the sounds of everybody's sort of feedback on it it sounds like they have managed it so yeah, yeah i think yeah. they did i think they they knocked it out of the park it's uh i was i was a little skeptical at first but that did not last for very long it's fucking great so um here is um what i probably am gonna call my song of the year um as i mentioned it's really kind of two songs but uh this is the uh jurassic section or part of the jurassic section from the second track on phanerozoic 2 mesozoic cenozoic by the ocean collective
All right, so we're down to number two. Uh, this is an album that we did discuss when it came out. Um, I probably said this back then, but I don't remember. I'll say it now. I So the band is Leached, and the album is To Dull the Blades of Your Abuse. Um, they've been around a while. They had an album before this, and I gave it a listen, and I just never really took to them. I was just like... Yeah, it wasn't bad, but it didn't really grab my attention. But anyway, Earth and Ash came out as a single, and I was like, I'll give it a listen. And I was like, hmm, well, that, that has one of the heaviest, you know, most macabre and downright brutal breaks that I've ever heard in this year. Uh, and an end section that sounds like some kind of satanic ritual, maybe a human being hoisted to burn and sacrifice or something. I don't know, my imagination runs away a bit. But anyway, <laughs> I really liked Earth and Ash. And I thought, yeah, I ended up at the album album launch because I wanted to see the support bands, Tusker and Geist. And uh, a mate of mine, Fatted actually, he goes, oh, let's go and watch them. And I was like, no, 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 not Leech, no, they're not very good. Anyway, we went and watched them and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is actually amazing. Um, and like over the year, I think it is probably the one most brutal, the brutal album that I've gone back to repeatedly this year. Uh, it just as extreme as and relentless it is there's just something that just really sits well with me it just it just gets everything just right from the off it's just a torrent of total negativity and it doesn't let up uh, it's been described as a bit like nails meets god flesh and that's fair but like like we said when we reviewed it before there's a lot of innovation going on the guitarist writes some really out there guitar lines with a lot of overdubs and strange effects which rather than sounding like he's running away with himself, it really contributes to the unsettling nature. There's keys and effects, but it's all like necessary and it contributes to the music as a whole. Uh, and in spite of this, it doesn't detract from, from what is basically an incredibly brutal and savage album. Uh, it's really well thought out. It's really intricate. It's really well paced and put together. It sounds like it's been written as an album. It has more experimental fare, such as Let Me Die, which is, uh, written from the view of a guy dying in a hospital bed um, and it's probably the greatest musical departure there and it's not conventionally heavy as such but it has this this air of being really disturbing and claustrophobic that just sets you on edge um, yeah in summary it's just brutal as hell, original, inventive excellently played, really well thought out and it's probably the best really really brutal album I've heard all year um, again this is probably what Code Orange think they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> what did you yeah, think? Yeah, no, I mean, like this, it's it's just savage, isn't it? Like it's it's yeah. just extremely um, tortured music, but like it's it's channeling all of that pain into just raw aggression, um, yeah. and it, it's yeah. I mean, as as if anybody's new to punishing brutality and listening to to this, you're probably getting the sense from from my list that I don't normally listen to stuff that's quite as punishing as this, and that's true. Um, it's just overwhelming how fucking yeah. brutal it is, um, and yeah. you, I, you for me. I have to be in the right kind of headspace to listen to something like this. I can't like kind of, you know, put it on with a cup of coffee in the morning. And, um, but you know, when you do listen to it, you just want to like break everything around you. And, uh, I think that's the intention. Yes. yes and it definitely achieves. It that. does. So let's listen to some leached, shall we? So this is earth and ash by leached. Let's go. 
so uh, my number two is Stare Into Death and Be Still uh, by Ulcerate from New Zealand on Dibbermore Morty Records. It is a grinding slab of tectonic heaviness. It is measured, purposeful, brilliantly executed extreme music. It's got a monumental title track, this slow atmospheric groove and, and this actually this is a really atmospheric album which i think is kind of unusual because this is kind of in the tech vein and it's but it's like it's yeah. such a technical record yet I, for me you don't notice unless you think about it it's more just this brooding atmosphere about it and that's just such a incredible thing to do when you're doing stuff this technical to make it atmospheric and not wanky but anyway um Grooves, yes, like in visceral ends. Um, some of the highlights of this fucking record. So, yeah, this album assumed my number one spot before it even came out, based purely on the singles, and it stayed there for almost the whole year before being just kind of gradually overtaken by the eventual champion. I mean, if I have one critique of Staring to Death and Be Still, it's probably that it's it's just so controlled. Is so like utterly precise in its delivery. You almost want it to fly off the handle occasionally, and it just never really does. It just kind of lurks there. It's all malevolent and coiled, and it just quietly and just systematically just breaks you down. Um, it's 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 such a methodical album. It's it's really it's it's really a fucking spectacular job, and I I I just love it um so yeah um ulcerate staring to death and be still is my uh, number two album of 2020 what, what do you make of that one chris it, it was insane wasn't it really yeah, it's fucking good it's just like what 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 to make of it it's just like actually as we said about cryptic shift being like the number one but in terms of technicality but it's probably ulcerate if we're honest the about drumming it. in this is fucking just, just out of this world yeah, it's just it's just crazy, and for me, it's like there's a lot to get your head around and a lot to kind of work out what the hell is going on with it. But it's also quite impenetrable it as is, well. So. Yeah, it's nowhere near as fast, is it? Like cryptic shift is, like, but this is like yeah. it's it's more technical in the kind of construction, uh, not yeah. so much in just like the kind of whittling. I mean, there isn't any whittling on this album. There's no fucking guitar solos or anything. It's just like building like layers of intensity yeah yeah i think you have to be in a certain mood for it but there's no doubt that it is like technically an incredibly proficient album and you know you understand why they're one of the most renowned kind of tech death sort of bands around at the moment and they always they're always called tech death but i just like they they i feel like they're sufficiently different from every other tech death band that they it's kind of a little bit misleading or unfair even to call them that i mean they, they are a death metal band they are technical but you need to think of something else for these guys anyway um so sure. yeah number two also right uh i'm going to play you a little bit of the title tracks there into death and be still
What's your number one, Wells? So, my number one is not punishing and it's not brutal. It's an album from a band that was about in the 90s. Uh, if I'm honest, the stuff that I'd heard, I knew of them and I'd heard bits. And other than a couple of songs, it didn't really blow me away that much. Um, I didn't expect my album of the year to come from a band that hadn't made anything in 22 years, let alone one that I didn't really like that much in the first place. But uh, yeah, in this case, it's Inlet by Hum. Um, comeback albums can be notoriously bad, uh, but not only was this not, but it actually like really kind of established Hum as a band that I, you know, I'm at least with this album, I'm really, really into. To me, it sounds like imagine if Smashing Pumpkins and Torch had decided that they're going to write the sequel to Siamese Dream, <laughs> but with loads of atmospherics over the top, and that's pretty much what it is to me. It's 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 like it's that perfect continuation of that sound that got lost basically somewhere along the line with, uh, you know, but it's got really, really heavy down tuned riffs, but kind of sounds laid back. There's no screaming, unfortunately, but what it does has is a constant optimistic, almost oceanic atmosphere, which to be honest is what you need in this year. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, in the den other than pariah in the den is probably my most played track of the year. Uh, it just has everything chunky, sludgy riffs, really ethereal keys and a proper dad rock driving section. Uh, rest of the album's pretty similarly styled. There's no jazz departures or crazy time signatures, but sort of in a bit like bit like Alcest has like a sense numbing kind of effect when you listen to it, and it just sounds really cavernous and just envelops you. Um, I have to wonder if this album had come out in the nineties, um, if maybe it, this would be the band that a lot of people would be talking about has been really really legendary. I mean, they are legendary to some extent anyway. They've had a lot of influence on people like Deftones and Torch, as we mentioned before. Um, you know, that Smashing Pumpkins influence really comes in and tracks such as Desert Rambler, um, which, you know, builds and builds before the end of it, it just absolutely flattens you. Um, and then you've got, like, the mix of everything. There's a track called The Summoning, which is, like, the riffiest track on there. And then it just goes all, like, celestial and spacey over the top. And, yeah, you know, it just goes from about as heavy as they go to one of the more atmospheric sections that they go to. And, uh, yeah, this is just an album that I went back to again and again and again, and I still think it's excellent. So this is my number one album for you, even if it's not particularly brutal. So there you go. What do you think? Um, yeah, so I, I, I totally get the, the um, Smashing Pumpkins comparison. Like, yes. the guitar tone is totally there. Uh, but the, the kind of whole vibe of it is, is a little different. It's, it's more kind of like dreamy vibe i don't i don't even know what to call it but yeah it's 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 very um very 90s um and and it surprises me that um you kind of come to it from a place of not being a a, a, a previous fan because everybody else that i've spoken to that kind of really likes this album is kind of like oh yeah well you know i loved home back in the 90s and now you know they brought back an album and it was just as good and you know took me back but in your case it's kind of they weren't they weren't known here though i mean they may have been there i never heard of them until about five or six years huh. ago um and i don't i don't ever remember there being a fuss about hull over here no one's ever recommended obviously in america it was a different story but not here yeah i i, know, uh, I never heard of them either so i i kind of i don't have any of that kind of nostalgia now as you know i am a massive massive fan of you know siamese dream and and, and some other stuff oh, yeah. from from that era um but yeah it just it, it just didn't quite like have the moments for me like it, it's 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 very nice kind yeah. of um kind of like music to have on but i found that every time that i listened to it um it i'd find that it had ended and started playing another hum album by the time i realized that it was over you know like it just did kind of like yeah yeah, yeah yeah it didn't kind of like come to any kind of climax of the album where i was like well you know that's the end kind of thing it was it's just like you know just kind of carrying on um and it is that yeah. kind of um you know it's not stoner music but it has that kind of like you know you, you can push it out that way though i think you can definitely argue that it's got that element in there i think without yeah. doubt so, but I mean, I for me, it just really, really hit. Yeah. Whatever it was, I was looking for, I just thought it was. Yeah, I thought it was fucking brilliant. So that is my number one album of the year, even if it's not particularly brutal. But I hope that two and three make up for the lack of brutality. My number one. So. <laughs> but, but I think I think <laughs> they do. Others. I think they do. 
I mentioned In the Den earlier, so let's listen to a bit of In the Den for some driving bad rock. Finally, and finally, Matthew, my, number, my one. number one is also not brutal at all. Oh. <laughs> it's not oh, brutal in the oh. slightest. Um, so yeah, so this album came out in March, um, and I really dug it. Like it, it just had this kind of like, I don't know, like this kind of sneaky good appeal about it. Like a sneaky good. You know, I guess English people don't say that, but it, but anyway, it's, it seems like such a stupid phrase because like it's obviously to me like a masterpiece. But it was one of those records that I finished and just sort of thought, yeah. I really enjoyed that. That was that was great. Yeah. And then I kind of went back to it again and again and again and and again and, and I guess by kind of like later in the autumn, I was like, shit, you know, like this is this is gonna be really high on my end of year list. Um, so yeah. so I bought this beautiful smoky blue vinyl from Discogs and by the way, Van Records who who put this one out of a knack for great presentation they hit it out of the park again um and and i just ultimately had to accept that this is the best album of the year and deservedly so so like the the band is is basically born out of the collapse of the swedish death metal band morbus crone um whose uh, second and final album was called sweven and so when uh, guitarist and vocalist robert anderson wanted to continue and evolve the ideas um the band that he created was also to be called Sweven, and the album is called The Eternal Resonance. 
Um, it's full on progressive death metal, though the death is coming from the vocals. There's nary a distortion pedal to be heard on this album. And, and there's, de there's definitely no blast beats. There's no double kick. It's full on prog, but I, I don't think it's like wanky. Um, anyway, anyway um, well, it's not entirely without its wankiness. Uh, Anderson brought in um, Isaac Koskin and Rosmarine. Uh, to play lead guitar and oh the beautiful leads they are uh solo in by virtue of promise is just like fuck yeah that that is how to place a solo in a fucking song um there's another one in uh, the soul importance which is a bit more shreddy but no less beautiful i mean it's a really long album i i, I understand it's a really fucking long album um but it's, 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 so it's well over an hour it's like 70 minutes or something um but I mean, and it's not just long. It's not just long in terms of time. It's long. Like, it, it, it's it's thoughtful. Stuff like this. I mean, it really, like, it needs time to, like, fucking gestate, or ruminate, or pontificate, or whatever. It, 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 needs, it, 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 it builds over a long period of time. But, like, it builds to a beautiful fucking climax. The end of um, Sanctum Sanctorum. It's just a stunning piece of melancholy and catharsis. It really does take a long time to get there, but when you finally do, it's like the glory days of Metallica, you know, with the kind of like little uh, picked uh, arpeggios and these choral aspects, which don't sound anything like Metallica, but um, just closing out the album. I mean, just, it's, it's just fucking magnificent. I I, I really love this album. I I, I didn't I had no idea when I first listened to it that this was going to be my album of the year like but it just kind of like kept creeping up and up and up and up the list and then you know ultimately kind of yeah. just dragged um ulcerate out of the top spot and um yeah it's 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 wonderful I mean it was definitely not what I was expecting there are a lot of different twists in there in the first few minutes I've kept expecting it to break into some wall of impenetrable tech death, but it never seemed to come. No, it doesn't. <laughs> doesn't just stays stays what it's like. It's, it's sad and and mournful and but cathartic too. Yeah, it just it was pretty chilled it's out a lot of the time. Chill. Yeah, I wouldn't call it frog exactly, but it did have a lot of writing twists and turns, which took it to a lot of unexpected places and. And again, I, I, I see like a lot of the material that you're into, but like, kind of goes back to Opeth in a yeah, way, I think, at least to some extent or sure. another. I definitely have some parallels with that. But are we going to listen yeah, to some? Yeah, so, uh, so I guess I will provide the end from uh, Sanctum Sanctorum. So here it is.
Okay, so that was yeah. our um, top tens of 2020. Yeah. Christmas, Christmas brutality. brutality. It's been fucking fun doing this again. It, it has been good, yeah. actually. Yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll come back. Yeah, you never one. know. You never know. Um, but we'll... If the, money, if the money's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You fucking pay us. We can start a crowdfunder, yeah. and then we'll do it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, yes, we sure. will uh, still maintain our presence on Twitter and the gram and Facebook and whatever. Fucking let us know what your lists are, dear listeners. We do miss you. We, we love to hear from you. It's been great for, when people have reached out and said, you know, like how sad they are that we're not doing this regularly anymore. I mean, it means a hell of a lot to us. Um, but um yeah let us know what's going on tell us your list tell us your your, uh, your number one and and everything else we can't wait to see what's going on and and we'll uh we'll be back with some more uh, pb and no doubt some fucking devastating brutality from wilson and some you know melodic nonsense from me uh in um yeah, in 21. Let's, let's just see it depends how much of a clusterfuck next well, year is yeah. isn't it which is Probably going to be just as much of a clusterfuck as this uh, one. I mean, so. the, the the orange one is not going to be around anymore, is he? So, like, you know, it's it's check. Well, if they drag him out of the fucking <laughs> White House, yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, on, on that note, you heard what fucking Boris Johnson oh, said. Man, what did he say? Uh, he said, uh, so he gave some like speech or some climate thing or other, and he said, we are not shirt-wearing, tree-hugging, mung-being, munching, eco-freaks. <laughs> he said this at a UN climate summit. How do our respective countries of residence both end up being led by such utter fucking knobheads. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's not really very much that, like, I mean, you know, sitting over here now, I can't really, can't really go criticise anywhere else because, hey, at least you guys got rid of your ballot. <laughs> yeah. Still, we did. Not, only, not only did he get in once, we fucking voted him in again. Yeah. And Brexit, I was just... Brexit's just about to... <sighs> yeah, anyway. Nah, anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll do a politics podcast next time. Yeah, absolutely. We're all, we're experts at that too. So. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been awesome. Merry Christmas, everybody, awesome. um, and uh, stay brutal. Yeah, as always. Bye bye.